of Genesis. We've been looking at the life of Abraham and showing you that uh, how Abraham's life is a picture of your life as a Christian. His life represents faith in your life. It shows you the ups and downs in your life as a Christian, the weaknesses, the failures, as well as the strength and the strong points. And so Abraham is a unique study. He's a unique individual life to look at because of his his faith and his walk with God. And there are several things that we've been noticing about Abram. And his name is Abram now, but later on it gets changed to Abraham. And uh, we'll talk to that when we get to that point. But uh, for those of you who may not understand with um, a, a, a proper method of Bible study, there's a formula on how we approach the Word of God. There is what is called types in the Bible. A type is a foreshadow of someone or something that re represents someone or something else, whether it be in the New Testament or something else. So Abraham represents to you and I the spirit of faith. He represents your walk with God as a Christian. God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. Now, if you remember that back in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 12, it says that God called him out. Just turn over there really quick in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said unto, Abr unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land which I will show thee. And we see the call of God right there. That call is, the, is a picture of the call of salvation in your life. That it came from God. It, it initiated with God himself. It didn't initiate with Abraham. It didn't initiate with anything that he had done. God just singled him out, and God called him out. And that's a picture of your salvation and my salvation. It was not something that you initiated. A lot of people think, well, I found Jesus. Well, Jesus wasn't lost. You were the one that was lost. And Jesus, he was the, he was the shepherd that come to what? Seek and to save that which was lost. You were the one that was going astray. You were the one that had nothing to offer God. But yet God's looked at you and says, I love you and I have chosen you and I've called you out of this world. That was by God's grace that you were saved. And that's what the Bible says. For by grace you are what? Saved through what? Faith. See that? It's by grace we are saved. It has nothing to do with it. And so this call of God in the life of Abram, it was, it was just nothing more than God's grace. It was nothing more than... It, Abraham didn't initiate it. It was God's call in his life. And I just love that about God, is that God looks down upon a people, and Jesus Christ says, come on unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Jesus Christ is always calling people to himself. And that's what God is showing us here. There was nothing significant about Abram. Abram. There was nothing special about him. God just singled him out and called him out, just as you and I with our salvation. And notice what else it says here, right? In uh, chapter 12, really quick, just to kind of give us a little bit of review of what was taking place here. And, and God tells him, and I will, I will make thee of a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So God singles him out. And look at it, look what God does in his life. God says, I'm going to do some great things in your life. Now, you may not realize this. As a Christian, the day you got saved, a lot of people don't realize this, but God has done some great things in your life. God says that he has made us kings and priests under his son, Jesus Excuse me, Jesus Christ. And God has done some great things in your life in a spiritual sense that you may not understand. At the time, Abraham didn't understand what God was going to do in his life. At the time, he had to go and just respond to the promises of God. And right now, you may be not understanding all the things that God has for you because we walk by faith and not by sight. You may not understand all the implications of everything that happened the day you got saved. You may not even understand that as a mature Christian, you may not not understand that but there were some things that took place in the supernatural realm in the spiritual realm that had taken place that God has done that are completely astronomical to the human mind God has done some great things the day of your salvation the day you responded to the call of God just as Abram did to the call of God in his life God blessed him and blessed him with great promises and that's what God says. He says, I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And that's, we talked about how God wants you to be a blessing to people in your life. And notice what God says. Now we know that this is pertaining to the nation of Israel and to the Jew, but you have to remember the Bible says that we were what? grafted in in Romans chapter 11. The Bible says that if we be if we be with Christ and we're born again, then are we Abraham's what? 
with Abraham's seed. So the blessings apply to you and I in a spiritual sense, not necessarily in the physical, but they do apply in the spiritual. And remember, God told Abraham that he was going to multiply his seed as the sand, that's the Jews, and as the what? And as the stars of the heavens. And so the stars are you and I, which that's what we represent. So we represent the spiritual blessings of the nation of Israel. And he says, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. Now he wasn't supposed to take Lot and we'll deal with that a little bit later on. But notice this call of Abraham, right? If you go back to chapter 11, right? You notice there was some unique things there because Abraham, God was dealing with Abraham while he was still in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram wasn't really necessarily responding to a lot of the things that God wanted him to do. And so what you see in chapter 11, that his father had passed away. And after the death of his father, now his heart is open. His heart is receptive to the word of God and to the will of God in his life. Now, sometimes God has to do some tragic things in this world to get a person to respond to the call and to the word of God in their life. God will do some things in your life that can, that can seem absolutely horrific in your life. But those things are the very movement in the very hand of God, moving the life and the life of a Christian by faith. That's what God does. God is constantly at work. Sometimes we don't see the hand of God. Sometimes we may not even be able to acknowledge what God is doing. But God is constantly moving in every aspect of your life, in every moment, in every second, in every detail. God's hand is at work. The Bible says that he that has begun a good work in you, he will perform it until the what? The day of Jesus Christ. And so God is constantly at work in your life. You may not realize that. You may not understand that, but God is constantly working. Okay? So now that we have kind of an understanding of what is going on. So Abraham represents the spirit of faith. He represents the life of a Christian. The call of God and the call of salvation was initiated by God himself, not you. It was God that called you. It was God that had spoken to you and called you out. And God has given you so many blessings as a Christian. God says he's going to bless us as a Christian. And remember, the blessings of God are not necessarily physical, but they're supernatural and they're spiritual and they're inward blessings. God may bless you physically with physical wealth and prosperity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the very blessings of God. The blessings of God are something inward. They're supernatural. They deal with in the seat of your emotions and your thoughts and the stability of your mind in your in, in, in a life walking without fear and apprehension and worry and confusion and doubt. Those are the very blessings that God will bestow upon his people. And so notice what happens here. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at chapter 13. Okay? And we're going to be looking at chapter 13. So you can open up there as we kind of just draw out a little bit more in this particular thought process of, a of Abraham here. Okay? And so now that you and I understand that our salvation was initiated by God himself, okay? The call of God, it comes to every human being. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, okay? Jesus Christ said, if he, the Son of Man, be lifted up, he will what? Draw all men to him, okay? God is not willing that any should perish. God is constantly calling people to come to him so he can do something in their life. That is what God wants to do. But Abraham still had to respond to the call of God in his life. Okay, now even though he responded to the call of God in his life, he did certain things that were not right. And the first thing that he did is he took Lot with him. And later on, we're going to see the problems, or in this chapter, we're going to see the conflict that Lot had created. And so Abraham was not supposed to take Lot with him. Lot was his nephew. He was not supposed to take anything from that particular point in his life. But he brings Lot with him, and Lot creates a lot of problems, and we'll see these difficulties in the life of Lot later on. Okay, so let's look at this now. We're in Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 13, and in verse 1. Now understand this with the life of Abraham. You're going to see that the Christian life is a journey, okay? Now in the Bible, it talks about this in the book of Hebrews. It says that these people, the Old Testament saints, they confessed that they were pilgrims. And what's the next word? 
and strangers in the earth. They confessed that they were pilgrims and strangers in this earth. If you study the life of the nation of Israel and the Jews, it's a funny thing because they were always traveling. You ever notice that? They were always on this journey. They were always on a pilgrimage. And you have to realize that you and I are nothing more than strangers and pilgrims in this world. And until you come to that conclusion, you will never do anything for God. Until you rest with the, your soul that you are nothing but a stranger and that you are nothing but a pilgrim in this earth, you will not progress for God. You will not do anything and you will never accomplish something for the Lord Jesus Christ until you come to terms in your life and it becomes a, a reality that this world is not your home. I believe that that is one of the greatest dilemmas in the life of Christians is that we get our roots down into this world. We hold on to this world. We love the world. We embrace the things of the world. And therefore, that keeps us from serving God and doing what God has called us to do. Any Christian who has never grown and has never impacted people's lives for the word of God, that is a Christian. He may not be drinking or doing all these negative things, but they have still have their roots in this world. They're, they're not focusing on the author and finisher of their faith, which is Jesus Christ. And they embrace the things of the world. That's why over and over in the Bible, we're told to what? Love not the what? World, neither the what? Things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? No. It's not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of, it is all the pride of life, and the world thereof passes away. But you and I are told to set your affection on things above and not on the things of this earth. For we are hid with Christ. That is going to be the number one thing, is just not being able to, setting your eyes on the physical realm and not the supernatural and the spiritual. That is going to be the number one thing that will destroy the work of God in the life as a Christian. And so Abram understood this in his life at an early age. If you were to read this to, in Hebrews chapter 11, it talked about how they walked by faith and not by what? And not by sight. That is the whole thing of the Christian life, is that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Not by what we see, but by what God says in his promises and his word to us. And so Abraham, Abraham he had, he's constantly on this journey as we've been seeing this thing happen here. So in chapter, we see this, and he goes down into Egypt, which he was not supposed to do. We've seen that. He went down into Egypt. And the Bible says, turn to the book of Isaiah really quick, Isaiah 31.1. Isaiah 31, 1. Now notice what this says. Isaiah 31, 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. You see that? What did Abram do? Remember, there was a famine in the land. Now, God had already told him that he was going to provide. God had already told him that he was going to sustain him. God has already told him that he was going to make a mighty nation of him. God, he had already received the promises of God. But you know what he was doing? He was fearful because he lacked what? He lacked faith. See, when you become afraid and fearful, that is a lack of faith. You you're not believing that God is going to trust you. You're not believing that God is going to provide for you. You're not, gonna, you're not believing that God's hand is protecting you and overseeing everything in your life. And what happens is, is the world projects this fear. We have fear about um, our, our finances. We worry about this. We worry about children. We worry about all of these different things. And worry is fear. If you don't realize that, fear and worry go together. The two exist together simultaneously. Okay? And so worry, depression, fear, anxiety, all of those things. And this is what happens in Abram's life. There's a famine. And what happens? Fear sets in. And from this point on, what does he begin to do? He begins to crash. He begins to go into, he goes down into Egypt. And we've seen what happened there. And God says, woe to them to go out down into Egypt for help. Egypt is a picture of the world. Egypt, when a person goes into Egypt, into the world, they're on a backslidden state. They're basically going away from God. Now, notice what Abram was doing at this particular point. He was no longer looking to the promises of God, but he was looking to the physical realm. That is the problem. You guys have to understand, I have to understand, is that we have to stop looking at the physical and start looking at the supernatural and the spiritual. That's why Paul writes, while we look, what? Not at the things that are what? Seen, but at the things that are what? Unseen. For the things that are seen are what? 
temporal. Everything you see in this building is temporal, including the person next to you. Their flesh is temporal. Their soul is eternal, yes. But everything you see, you walk into your house, and everything in your house is temporal. You, everything, your car is temporal. Your possessions are temporal. Everything in this world is temporal. And if, listen, folks, and if it's not eternal, it's not what? It's not real. It's not real. So here we are, we're living in a temporal world until we step into heaven and God's kingdom. That's when we step into reality. So many people, even Christians, they assume that this is reality. This is not reality. Reality is when we step into eternity. That's when you step into what is true reality. See, this is why people have to have entertainment and things. And, and why? Because they have to allure their mind into some other direction so they don't have to face with what is reality. Why do you think people get high? Why do you think people have to drink? Why do you think people have to smoke dope and take pills? Because they can't cope with what is supposable a reality. That's why people do the things they do. Abram is filled up with fear and worry at this particular point. There's a famine in the land. He, he's, he, he literally just pushes the promises of God aside and he says, no, what are we going to do? There's, there's no food. There's no food. There's no famine. So what does he do? He goes down into Egypt. We see here in Isaiah, woe unto them to go down into Egypt for help. Look at this. And stay on the horses and trust in chariots because they are, they are many in, in horsemen because they are very strong. But they, uh, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel. See that? Neither seek the Lord. So what do, what do we see with Abram? He goes down in there into, into Egypt. He wasn't seeking help from the Lord. He didn't seek counsel, direction, and wisdom from God. He, re, he literally took the promises of God, and he, and he just kind of pushed them aside as though they weren't even real in his life any longer. He began to doubt the promises and the presence of God in his life. He doubted God's promises, he doubted God's presence, and he doubted God's protection in his life. That's what happens when you doubt the promises of God, when you doubt the presence of God, when you doubt the, uh, the power of God and the protection of God in your life. Let me tell you something, fear and worry is gonna set in. Fear, worry, doubt, confusion, apprehension, all these different mixed emotions that Abraham was facing at this particular point in his life. And we see that he goes down into Egypt. We've seen that. He goes down into Egypt. And from that point on, it, it's an awful thing. He lies and says, Sarah's his sister. You guys know the whole story. We, we already covered it. But the unique thing was, one of the things I love about this particular illustration in the Bible that God gives us is that Abraham was in a backslidden state, doing everything wrong, but yet God's hand was still protecting him. Did you ever notice that? God was still blessing him while he was doing everything wrong. And not only that, but he was doing everything wrong. And God still delivered him from what? From Egypt. Aren't you, don't you believe that God's going to deliver us from this crazy world? Because that's what he's going to do. He's going to deliver us from this present evil age that we're living in. And God's hand of deliverance was upon him. And notice what even happens is we've seen that, is, is that the king of Egypt, the people of Egypt, they were cursed because of Abram. Not because of their wrongdoings, because Abram led them astray with a lie, but because of what Abram did, God's judgment was upon them. <clears throat> and yet God delivered his man. You want to know why? Because God had already made a promise with him. You see, God cannot reverse his promise. The Bible says it's impossible for God to what? Lie. To lie. God cannot reverse his promises. My Bible says that if thou wilt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. Saved. God cannot reverse that. God can't reverse anything in the word of God. Listen, God's promises are yea, yea, and nay, nay. Listen, his promises cannot be uh, twisted or altered or perverted. The promises that God has given to us in the Bible shall come to pass. That's the unique thing about God's word. But they that look unto the Holy One of Israel, look at this, look at this. But they that look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. That's what Abram was doing at this particular point in his life. And what did he do? He goes down into Egypt. All right. So now the title of this message, I just wanted to review some of that. But I want to talk to you this morning about what to do after you messed up. 
all right? What to do after you messed up? Everybody's going to mess up. Your, your life is just like Abram, just like any other character in the Bible. And how many guys have read Hebrews 11? Most of us, everyone knows Hebrews 11, and we call that the Hall of Fame of Faith. You see the greatest characters in the Bible, and they're mentioned in the Hall of Fame. But you know what's mentioned? Not their, not their weaknesses, but their strengths. It's kind of a unique thing, but anyone who has done any sport, you know, some of you guys that have played football, they took your, you know, your, your um, highlight clip. They didn't take your messing up and failures, but they took the strengths and the very strong points that you were doing, and they sent that in, and they made a good highlight clip of you. You know what God does of you? God doesn't see your weaknesses. God doesn't see your inconsistencies. After you receive Jesus Christ, you know what God sees? He sees a finished product in you. That is awesome because, you know, God, when you think about the, the people that were mentioned, you have Abraham was mentioned over there. It didn't mention how he lacked faith and went down into Egypt twice and lied about his wife. It, did, it doesn't mention in Hebrews chapter 11 how Abraham doubted God about giving him a child and he, had, and he took Hagar for a woman, for a wife and had a child with her. See, that wasn't mentioned. Because God doesn't bring up our failures and our weaknesses. God looks to our strengths. He looks to the finished product of what he's accomplishing in you. So many times we don't understand these things. We begin to beat ourselves up and God says, oh no, you're a child of mine. Now let's look at this a little bit further, okay? Let's see how this whole thing is going to work, begin to work out. So now we're in chapter 13, okay? Now, in chapter 13, right? And if you were to look at verse 1, Abram, after uh, his, his downhill spiral, after everything that he does, when he goes down back into Egypt, he comes back out of there, okay? So I want to show you a couple things. Just turn to Proverbs 24 and verse 16 real quick. Proverbs 24 and verse 16. Now look at it says here. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You're going to see every individual in the Bible fall into whether it be sin or whether it be a lack of faith or something. All right. Every character in the Bible had their weaknesses as well as their strengths. Every character in the Bible, every person you see had their own battles with their spiritual walk with God. Abraham represents to you and I that spiritual walk with God. He shows you and I the ups and downs, the strengths and the weaknesses, the failures and the victories in the life of a believer. Abraham, he, he shows the, the, the struggles of the Christian life and the battles that it can be. It's an ongoing process in the life of a Christian. Abraham was told to live in tents and build altars his entire life. The tent shows that it was nothing but a pilgrimage, and the altar shows the place of worship and sacrifice when he turned back to God. Now let's look at this. Let's talk about what to do after you messed up, okay? Genesis chapter 13 and verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt. The first thing I want you to see, that he, notice what we just looked at back in the book of Isaiah. Turn back to Isaiah 31. All right, turn back there really quick. Now look at this. It says, woe unto them, say it out loud, that what? Go down into Egypt. You ever notice that? See, God is saying, woe unto them that go down into Egypt. If you were to look at that geographically on the map, Egypt was below the, or the, uh, the, um, the land of Canaan. Now understand this. Notice that God likens Egypt to a downhill spiral. Okay? Once you start going in that direction, you're going away from God, you're going further from God, and you're going on a downhill spiral. Now notice what happens here in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 1. And Abram went what? He went up. He went up out of Egypt. Notice this, right? He, now notice, remember what just happened. All of a sudden, God comes through in a clinch for him. You ever notice that every, you mess things up and then all of a sudden God like saves you high? Does that ever happen to anybody here other than me? You, you do some stupid stuff and then God comes along and he cleans it up really quick. And you're like, whoa, thank God. And the Bible says it's the goodness of God that leadeth us to what? 
Repentance. You ever read that verse? It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And all of a sudden, you're doing some stupid stuff and you're still seeing the blessings of God. You go, oh, what, is, what am I doing? And you realize, just like Abram, that it's time for you to get back up and stop going down away from God. And Abram went up out of Egypt. Now remember, if anyone should have been cursed, it should have been him. He's the one that lied about his wife and, and, they, and they took his wife. And you guys know the story. And Pharaoh took his wife. And Pharaoh and all of Egypt get cursed because of him. And Abram went up. Look at this. Out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him. There's another problem. We'll deal with that later on. We'll see what happens in this portion of Scripture in a minute. But notice this. And Lot goes with him. Okay? And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and gold. Now, how do you think he got rich? Do you guys ever think about that? Pharaoh was shoveling him money and gold and silver for his wife, who was supposedly his sister, Sarah. You guys with me on the story? Everyone with me? That's why he, he's getting richer and richer. Now, here he is, Abram. He's doing that which is wrong, but God's hand and blessing is still upon him. Why? Because God made a promise that he can't break. Listen, your salvation, right, is a blood promise, and it's been sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. You could do some pretty stupid things, right? And guess what? It cannot be undone. It cannot be undone. Thanks, thanks be to God for that, right? Because listen, by tomorrow morning, you would have had that thing already undone. <laughs> Trust me on that. Yeah. But by the end of the day, some of us would have had it undone and redone and undone three or four times by the end of the day. Listen, it's a blood covenant promise given by God himself. Listen, these promises that God made to Abraham, they weren't based on what Abraham was going to do or what he wasn't going to do. They were based on God and who he is and who he was. They're based on the promises of God and nothing that he was going to do. And Abraham was very rich in, in, cattle and, uh, in, in cattle and silver and gold. Pay attention to silver and gold. Silver is the price of redemption and gold is the deity. We're going to look at that in a little bit, but look at this. And he went on his journeys from the south even to where? Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. So what did he do? He goes right back to the very place where God was really part of his life. You know, when you get away from God, you go into Egypt for a little while. You're not coming to church. Bethel means the house of God. That's what that word means. It means the very house and the dwelling place and the abode of God. Bethel is the blessing place of God. It was in Bethel he made the sacrifice. It was in Bethel God spoke to him. It was in Bethel where he heard the voice of God and he received the promises of God. It was in Bethel where God gave him strength and God told him what he was going to do in his life. It was in Bethel where he had union and communion with God when he was in Egypt. Egypt, that fellowship was broken. And it wasn't broken based on what God did. It was broken because of Abram turned his back and walked away from God. Most Christians, they get called out of Egypt and they still remain in Egypt. God has called you and I, right, out of Egypt. Egypt is a picture of the what, people? It's a picture of the world, right? They still embrace the world. They still love the world. Listen, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Plain and simple. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And the world thereof, what? Passes away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Something that is constantly confirmed in the Bible. So no notice what happens here, right? So it, this is what this is, Abram is rising back up. He's the just man that we just looked at in Proverbs. He falls seven times, but what does he do? He rises back up each and every time. What to do after you messed up? Get back 
to the place that is Bethel in your life. When you mess up and failure has come in your life and weaknesses and a lack of faith has come in and you may even have gone down into Egypt for help. You may have gone down into Egypt for counsel. You may have went down into Egypt for hope and comfort. You may have spent some time into Egypt in this world, but you have got to get back to Bethel, the place where God can bless you again, the place where God can speak to you again, the place where you and God are in union together again. You got to get back to the place, Bethel. Abram's rich with cattle and silver and everything and gold. God still blessed him even in his disobedience. And he went on his, on his journey from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Now look at this, right? What was he doing while he was in Egypt? Was he serving God? Nope. Nope. Some of you have ever backslid and you get away from God. You know you're not serving God. You're not witnessing. You're not telling people about Christ. And by all means, you're not bringing people to church. <laughs> you're not bringing people to salvation. See, a lot of Christians, right, while you're in Egypt, Yes, you're saved. The promises of God still apply to you. The blessings, the protection, everything still applies to you. But you have to understand, there's no place of sacrifice in your life. You think that Jews were performing sacrifices while they were in Egypt? No, they weren't. Do you think Abram, at this point in his life, was offering to God sweet-smelling sacrifices to God? No, he wasn't. While he was in Egypt, there was no worship, there was no sacrifice, there was no communion with God. And by the way, just because you come to church once a week on a Sunday, it doesn't mean that you're not in Egypt. Egypt can be a state of mind or state of being or something literally and even physically. Think about this. The Bible says to be calmly minded is to be an enmity against God, right? To be kind. James says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is what? Enmity, enmity against God. God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world shall be the enemy of God. To be calmly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Guys, we have to understand something here. Just because we come to church, it doesn't mean that mentally... And emotionally, we're not still living in Egypt. Now notice what happens here, right? So we see he's on his way up. He's getting right with God at this particular point, okay? And notice what happens here. Let's, let's keep going on, right? And he goes back into Bethel, the, Bethel, the house of God, the house of blessing, the place where God wanted him, okay? And he says, unto the place, uh, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at what? First, you know what you have to do to get right with God? Okay? You want to know what you do after you messed up royally? You, what do you do? Remember from whence thou art fallen, Revelation chapter 3. Remember. Remember your relationship with God. Remember when you first got saved and you loved God and you felt his presence in your life and you would open up the Bible and tears would come to your eyes? Remember that? Do you remember when you would fall into conviction if you did something wrong? Do you remember that? You say, Pastor Mike, I don't remember any of that. Then you probably never get saved. Seriously. But do you remember when the Spirit of God, when you were so hungry for the Bible that you didn't even want to put it down and you'd carry it everywhere? Remember that? Do you remember that? As newborn babes, you desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. So when you've fallen down and you've messed up, the first thing you do is remember the love and the grace that you had for Jesus Christ. Just remember your walk with God. Remember the beginning of it. It says, remember in the book of Revelation. It says, what? Then the next thing, remember, and it says, return. This is what Abram's doing. He got back to the place where he could be blessed by God again. He got back to the place where he would offer sacrifices unto God. He got back to the place where he was getting right with God in his life. Now, it may be a physical place to you in something just getting back to church. 
But is it something, a spiritual or an emotional state of mind where you can focus back on worshiping God and that you are offering yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable, Reasonable service. If you're not offering yourself up as a living sacrifice, you may still be down in Egypt on a downhill spiral. Now look at this, right? Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. So we have remember, repent, and then what? Return. Just remember from whence thou art fallen. Repent from it, turn from it, and what? Return back to that place of Bethel in your life. Get back to the place where you're one with God. Get back to the point where the Spirit of God can minister to your heart and soul. That's what you do. Listen, everybody's going to have failures and difficult times in their life. That is the life of the Christian. Let me show you something else here now. Okay? Genesis again. Just let me get right over there. Because I want to just show you this, right? All right, let's look at this, right? We're in chapter 13. And let's back up a little bit right here. So we see that he has flocks and herds and everything, right? Now, chapter 13, and let's look at it there in verse, um, in verse 4, okay? Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, there Abram what? Oh, Called Lord. on the name of the Lord. He's back to the place of Bethel. First, look at it. First, geographically, where is he? He's out of Egypt. He's separated from the world. You guys with me on that? The first thing you gotta do is separate yourself from the world. Number one, separate yourself from the world. There's gonna be people, things, and places that you need to separate yourself from so you can get back to the point where God can speak to you. That is the place of Bethel, the house of God, the blessings of God, the movement of the Spirit of God. That is the place. It may be the physical place, but more so it's a spiritual place in the state of your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, and in your heart. You could be right with God and may even not even be here on a Sunday morning. But you could be here on a Sunday morning and the state of your mind is still in Egypt. The state of your being is still in Egypt. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. And especially if you're coming into church grudgingly, that's, that means somebody's like dragging you here, or like, and you're like, oh, you're like, when's he gonna be over? Come on, we all, let's be honest with ourselves. If you're not excited about being in church, Bible study, and, and you're still in Egypt, bottom line, you're still in the world. If you're not excited about D1, D2, and you're like just diving in, like give me more, give me more, something isn't right. Now look, watch what takes place here now. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and, t and tents. Notice what, what is Lot missing that Abraham had? Silver and gold. He's missing the silver and gold. Pay attention to that, people. Now look at this. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. I mean, they just had so much substance. They had so many flocks and, and people and everything that they couldn't even, the land just couldn't sustain the people and the herds. Look this. Now notice this. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Prezite dwelt in the land. So now we have a problem here. We've got a conflict here, okay? Now, once again, you're going to constantly see conflict in the Bible, okay? Now, but there's a way to resolve conflict, but notice what happens in verse 8. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be what? No, no strife. strife. Notice this. Abram's like, we're not going to fight about this. You ever get around some people, they just like to pick a fight? Now, how many guys see people like that? Listen, if you want to fight with me, we'll get on the mats and we'll fight. I'm, I'm all happy with that. We'll get in a ring, we'll get in a cage, and we'll fight. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not one of these guys going to sit here and go, rah, 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 and fight. No. Neither does Abram. 
You're going to be around some people that are very controversial and they almost are argumentative and they like conflict. There are people that are like that. Let me tell you something. Avoid them. Just avoid them. The Bible tells you to avoid them, literally. Look at Romans chapter 15 when you get a chance. It tells you to avoid them. There are certain people that you just have to avoid. Guys, there's going to be certain people even in church. You just got to avoid them. They want to create conflict. They want to create strife. Listen, that is not a spiritual thing. Guys, I don't, let's turn over to the book of James really quick, right? Let me show you something here, right? Turn to the book of James, right? It talks about the wisdom that is from God, the wisdom that is above, it's one that's earthly, sensual, and it's devilish. What, what chapter is that? Chapter 3? What is it? Is it 317? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, look at that, 317, right? Now, watch this, because this is very important, right? Okay, let's back up a little bit, right? And we're going to back up to verse, um, verse 13. Because Abraham is producing this in his life, okay? Abraham does what's right here, and this is why this is an important portion of Scripture. Because we see that because Abraham is right with God, it allows him to have wisdom and discernment and discretion. Is everyone with me on that? While he's in Bethel... The blessings of God are upon him, but the blessings of God are something that are emotional. They give you stability. They give you insight. They give you wisdom. They teach you how to cope with problems and struggles and strife. Okay, now look at this, verse 13. Who is a, who is a wise man endured with knowledge among you? Watch this. This is what Abraham does. Let him show it out of a good what? Conversation. His works with meekness of wisdom. Okay, somebody who has wisdom, they're, they're going to have meekness, they're going to deal with things properly. Now watch this, but if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the what? The truth. Now look at this, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and say it out loud, it's devilish. Okay, now watch this, for where envy and strife is, there is what? There is confusion. You see that in every what? Evil work. Evil work. So when you have envy and you have, what's the other word? Strife. You have what? Confusion. And you have every what, people? Evil every evil work. So envy, bitterness, and it, it creates confusion. And what does it do? It creates an avenue for every what? Evil work. It creates a pathway for every evil work. But the wisdom that comes from God, that is from above, it's pure, then what? Peaceable, Peaceable gentle, and I love that next, easy to be what? Entreated. Entreated. We talked about that word a few weeks ago. It means they're easy to be around. Easy to be entreated. It's somebody that is easy to approach. It's, it's easy to have a conversation with them. It's easy to get along with them. <laughs> But those other people that are filled with strife and all those other things. Okay, now let's turn back there to Genesis chapter 13. So we see the land wasn't able to bear them. Now we're seeing that there's a strife between the two, the herdsmen of cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. In verse 7, and the Presbyterians dwell of the land. Now look at this, and Abram said unto Lot. Now here's we have two types of people, Okay. You've got the spiritual land, and then you've got the what? The carnal man. Now, obviously, who represents the carnal man in this particular story with these two people? It's Lot. You say, why? Well, because watch what Lot does and how he acts. Now, by the way, Abram was never supposed to take Lot with him. Lot was one of them dead-end things that he had to cut off. You say, Pastor Mike, that's terrible. That was his nephew. Yep, and God says, cut him off. See, sometimes we don't think the way God thinks. We think that we're all just supposed to hold hands and sing, Kumbaya, my Lord, all holding hands together. Well, some of you guys, I'm going to hold your hand, first of all. And then, and then there are other people that you got no business holding their hands, singing Kumbaya, if you know what I'm saying. I'm speaking figuratively in speech. Now watch this, right? So God literally 
wanted him not to, didn't want him to bring Lot. Now this is a moving point in, a, in the life of Abram. This is a place of progression in his life. Now remember, he's finally back in the house of what? Bethel, the place of God, right? He's finally offering back up to God, but now all of a sudden there's a conflict. So here's Abram, he's getting right with God, but there are still some loose ends in his life that God had to deal with. And these are those loose ends. Lot was nothing but a loose end. Lot is a picture of a, a carnal man who walks by sight and not by faith. Now look at this. And Abram said, un, said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, uh, for we be brother. Notice this. He doesn't want any strife. He, he's like, listen, I'm not going to fight with you about this. Yeah, there's, there's a conflict. We got a problem. We have a legit problem here. But Abram, Abram's like, I'm not going to fight with you about it. And not only am I not going to fight with you about it, but watch the response of a spiritual individual. Watch the response. The response of Abraham is a response of Philippians chapter 2. Even though Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 6 wasn't written yet, but Abraham responds to it. Show me your hands if you know Philippians chapter 2. Okay, so we need to go there, all right? So we'll go there in just a minute. Just stay with me, right? Now watch this. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray, between me and thee, between thy herdmen and my herdmen. He goes, it is not, <clears throat> is not the whole land before thee. He says, separate thyself, I pray thee from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the what? Right. right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will what? Go to the left. He's like, listen, whatever you choose. Notice the spiritual man. The Bible says, he that handles a matter wisely shall what? Fine, good. You know what the spiritual man does? Watch Philippians chapter 2. Because let's turn there. Philippians chapter 2 real quick. Philippians chapter 2 real quick. A lot of Christians need how to resolve conflict. In church, out of church, and at home. Look at this, right? This is what Abraham does. If there, Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any consol consol consolation in Christ. Watch this. If any comfort of love. If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through what? Do you see that? So Abram, Abram at this point, he's eliminating strife. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others what? Better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the what? Things of others. You know what Abram was doing? He was looking to the needs of his nephew. He says, hey, listen, nephew, you take whatever you want. He represents a spiritual man. Let's take a look at the carnal man and see what he does, and then we'll end with that. So watch this now, and look what happens. In verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered, Everywhere, even the Lord, look at this, and the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of, of, of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as so comest thou to Zoram. You know what Lot did? He lifted up what people? He's like, look at this land. I'm getting the better side. You see how the common man thinks? The common mind, right, is an enmity against God. And if Lot was spiritual, you know what he would have said? I don't want any strife either. You make the decision because you are the head of this whole organization. You took me, so you make the decision. Did you guys get that? Did some of you really get it? One more time, stay with me. Lot should have said as a spiritual man, Abraham took him. So Lot should have said, hey, Abram, you're my uncle, you're the elder. You're the leader, Abram. You took me. And so you take the choice. I don't know if some of you are really getting that, but hopefully you are. But he didn't. So then see what happens in verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed, say that word out, east. east. You guys remember we talked about the movement from east to west? So where's Lot going? He's going in the wrong direction. 
because he's walking by sight and he's not walking by faith. Abram says, you choose because I've got the blessings of God and I'm not worried about it because I walk by what? Faith and not by what? Sight. sight. And so look what happens here now. Man, this gets crazy here. And Abram, look at this, right? So, so Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from another. Lot goes in a bad direction. We see nothing but a downhill spiral from Lot from this point on in his life. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the, what, what is it? The cities of the plains, and he pitched his tent toward what? Wow. We'll end with that, folks. But you know what he did? Actually, look at verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You notice how that's found in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13. And if you count the words, there's 13 words in there. That number 13 shows, shows rebellion. Genesis 13, verse 13, 13 words there. The beginning of Lot's downhill spiral. We see two men, Abraham and Lot. They were brethren. There was a strife between them. We've seen what one man does, the spiritual man, and we've seen what the carnal man does. The spiritual man, he walks by what? Faith and not by sight. Lot lifts up his eyes and he's like, ooh, look at this. He turns his back on God and he goes to what? The east. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. You as a Christian, get back to Bethel, the housings and the blessings of God. Get back to the place where God can bless you. Abram was down in Egypt. Doesn't say how long he was there, but he was there for a while. He was there for a while. Then he realized he had to get back to the place called Bethel, the house of God, the blessings of God, the presence of God in his life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We thank you for the word of God that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for what it contains. Just thank you for the life of Abraham. There's so many applications that we can learn from. I pray that you would encourage your people that if they've messed up, they've failed, help them to get up, rise up, and to go back to Bethel back to the altar, the place of sacrifice. And Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. And help us, Lord, not to be like Lot, and just looking at the things of, that we see. And Lord, this poor man, he, he pitched his tent towards Sodom, a wicked and an adulterous generation. He pitched his tent towards such evil and immorality that it corrupted his whole family and his whole life. Lord, help us to learn from these things, Lord. Help us to to look to the spiritual things, Lord. Help us to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Help our eyes to be stayed on you and not the things of this world, not the evil that is all around us. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask you to forgive us for our sin and that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And Lord, we pray, God, that we will be the spiritual person when strife arises and tension and difficult to rise that we be spiritual enough not to engage with it as Abram didn't engage in the spiritual conflict and, and the Bible tells us don't answer a fool according to his folly at least I'll be like him help us not to be in, engaged in conflict and strife but give us wisdom and discernment on how to deal with it Lord in Christ's name we pray Amen Amen, Amen. Amen.